open them to the Gospel of John, chapter 19. John 19, as we want to address the subject of Jesus Christ's crucifixion. What do you see when you look at a cross? Many years ago, here in the United States, there was a couple named Arnold and Barbara Rowland. A couple from Texas who had never seen a president of the United States before. So on November 22nd, 1963, they decided, hey, the president is coming to town. Let's go see him close up and in person. So they found a spot along a sidewalk in Dallas where they knew that the president's motorcade would be going by. And it was 12.15 that day. And before the president came with his motorcade, which is about two miles away at that point, Arnold was standing there on the sidewalk, looking around at the scene and the crowd that was gathering. And he, he elbowed to his wife standing next to him. And he said, hey, honey, look up there. I think I see a Secret Service agent up there. He saw a man standing several floors up in a tall building a man with a very high-powered rifle uh, across his chest in what the military would call port arms. And by the time he turned to his wife and, and, and said, do you see that? Do you see that? She was distracted. Distracted with another scene that had taken place right across the street. There was a man who had gone into an epileptic seizure. And the crowd was gathering there all around this uh, poor individual, and, and so she watched that for a while, and she said, well, you know, honey, if, if you see him again, you see that Secret Service agent, uh, uh, let me know. So Arnold looked around for a while, several more minutes passed, and he didn't see him again. How unfortunate, because had Arnold notified a policeman nearby that there was somebody with a high-powered rifle, certainly no 22 caliber, standing up in a building just to check and make sure that was a Secret Service agent. He might have changed the course of American history as Lee Harvey Oswald then would have shot the president just 14 minutes and 45 seconds later. But Mr. Rowland didn't know what he was looking at. He didn't understand. And you know, when it comes to the cross of Jesus Christ, many people, though they may see, they don't understand. This was a problem in the Lord Jesus' day. That's why in Matthew 13, verses 13 and 14, it says, Seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. And that is especially true when it comes to the cross. For in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 15, it goes on to say, uh, regarding the crucifixion scene, that in those, those passed by wagged their heads at him and said, Aha, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking among themselves with the scribes, said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, you can hear the, the scorn in their voice, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. What they failed to see was that the epitome of being the Christ, the King of Israel, was staying on that cross so that he could die for the very sins of those who were mocking him right there, and in fact, the sins of the entire world. Many people look at a crucifix, as I did growing up. I had one positioned in my bedroom, went to church, saw it there every week. They look at the events of Passover week, 33 AD, and they see the details, but they don't understand the significance. What did Jesus Christ accomplish by dying on that cross? Well, that's why we're going to look at the Gospel of John this morning, which has been called by some the spiritual gospel, because it really emphasizes the significance of the events of Calvary and that Passover week in 33 AD. 
Thus I had you turn in your Bibles to John chapter 19. Let's begin reading in John 19, picking it up in verse 14. It says, now it was the preparation day of the Passover. By the way, that's the day right before the Sabbath when the lambs for the Passover were being put to death to get their blood. And it was about the sixth hour, which in Roman time was 6 a.m. Jesus Christ would be put on the cross in about three hours by 9 a.m. our time. And he, that is Pontius Pilate, said to the Jews, Behold your king! But they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? Huh. Has any king ever been crucified before? That seems inconsistent. Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar, which was utterly blasphemous and wrong. Then he delivered him, Jesus Christ, to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side and Jesus in the center. We see, first of all, from this account in John 19 with the details of Christ's crucifixion, that there was a particular place where he was crucified. It was called the place of the skull in Greek, or in Hebrew, Golgotha, or as we have come to know it through its Latin term, Calvary. We sing songs about Calvary, but we're not magnifying the location per se, we're magnifying what actually transpired there on that occasion. And you can see the derivatives for each of these terms, but the significance is not so much in the terms or even the location right outside of, right in Jerusalem there. Religion has come along and built upon these two sites elaborate structures. There's an Orthodox church built right over one place, a traditional site where they believe Jesus Christ was crucified and rose. And you can see the elaborate church that's built there, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, it's called, where supposedly he was buried and also not far from there, where he was crucified as well. And then there's also a place in Jerusalem called Gordon's Calvary, a place that was discovered 100 years or so ago, 150 years ago or so by a British explorer named uh, Gordon, who found this rock formation right outside of the temple area in Jerusalem that looks like a skull. And he thought, well, this certainly fits what the Gospels describe. And so now the Muslims have taken this over because it's part of their section of Jerusalem, and they've turned it into a little tourist trap. So whether it's religion or whether it's a tourist trap, you can see that man has built upon these sites something they think is very significant, but in both cases, they miss what Christ has accomplished. Let's read on in John 19, verse 19. It says, Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Then many of the Jews read this title, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Therefore, the chief priests and the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Was Jesus Christ truly king of the Jews? You see, the Jews had in their expectation that a, the Messiah would be a king who would come and who would overthrow the Romans, who would conquer the world in terms of military, national power, and might, to be an international ruler. And the Old Testament certainly describes the coming Messiah as one whose government will prevail upon planet Earth and there'll be peace as a result. But the Old Testament also describes the coming Messiah as one who would come and die first for the sins of mankind. That's why in John's Gospel we see that though it describes 
him as king, his crucifixion fulfills a theme in John's gospel of a sacrificial kingship. A sacrificial kingship. Turn with me to John chapter 1. Just put a marker here, we'll come back to chapter 19. The fact that Christ is king is mentioned several times throughout John's gospel. But right here in the very first chapter, as though God is handing a pair of eyeglasses to the reader that are tinted with the perspective of Christ's kingship, he hands that to every reader through the testimony of Nathaniel, and he says, here, I want you to see who Jesus Christ really is. He's the king. Thus, in John chapter 1, in verse 49, Nathaniel comes to the Lord Jesus, and he says to him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. In other words, if you're impressed with the fact that I knew who you were before I met you and I knew your thoughts and could read your mind and I told you about it, you're going to see greater things than that. And I think the greater things in John's gospel would include the fact that he has died for our sins and risen again. Going on, let's flip over to John chapter 6 where we see another reference to him as king. It is very insightful. In John chapter 6, he has just fed the 5,000 with loaves and fishes, turned a handful of loaves and fishes into enough to feed a crowd of 5,000 with 12 baskets of fragments remaining, one basket for each of the disciples. So in verse 14, the crowd has perceived this miracle that's taken place. Verse 14 says, Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, This is truly the prophet who is to come into the world, the one who's predicted in the book of Deuteronomy, a prophet like Moses. Now, was Jesus that prophet? Yes, he was. But was he more than just a prophet? Yes, he was. But they missed that. Verse 15 Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. Now, why didn't he accept their desire to want to make him king? Wasn't he the king of Israel? Wasn't he the rightful Messiah? Yes. But he recognized that what they wanted was a crossless Messiah. One who wouldn't go and die for their sins first. For they were not seeing that their greater need than to have their Roman occupiers overthrown was to have one in co come and die for their sins so that they could be eternally saved, not just physically saved. And so Jesus Christ does not reject the title of king, but his kingship is defined in a different way. Turn with me to John chapter 12 next. We're fast-forwarding in the Gospel of John up to chapter 12 where we've come to what's often called Passion Week, the week leading up to Jesus Christ's crucifixion. And in fact, on a Monday, what's often called the Day of the Triumphal Entry where Christ enters Jerusalem, he was hailed when he entered Jerusalem. And so in chapter 12, verse 12, it says, The next day a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took branches of palm trees, and they went out to meet him, and they cried out. By the way, the palm had come to represent redemption among the people of Israel at that time. Deliverance or redemption. That's what the palm stood for. So they went out to meet him, and they cried out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Now, do you know what Hosanna means? It means save now, literally. And so they're quoting one of the Psalms here. Save now. Do they recognize that he is a spiritual savior at this point? Or are they still thinking in terms of a physical deliverer? It's the latter, isn't it? 
Verse 14, then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written, and he quotes from Zechariah here, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. So he's called king in verse 13, he's called king in verse 15. But what kind of king was he? A unique king. Do you know that the very day that Jesus Christ entered here into Jerusalem and was hailed by this crowd was the very day in which the lambs for the Passover that would be slaughtered at the end of the week, that those lambs were selected and set aside, they were marked for execution? How ironic that it's the very day Christ enters Jerusalem. And he's hailed as a king, and they say, save now. Oh, he would. You see, Jesus Christ came into this world for a purpose. Yes, he came to reign one day, but really he was born to die first. Matthew 1, verse 21, Matthew's gospel. When the angel appears to uh, Joseph and, and to Mary, uh, they, they are told that the name of the baby that they are going to be having is Jesus. Matthew 1, 21, And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. What is so significant about the name Jesus? Well, it comes from a Hebrew word, that's a derivative of the word for Joshua, Yahashua, which means literally Jehovah or Yahweh saves. So there is significance even in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the naming of our Savior foreshadowed the fact that he would die as a sacrificial substitute one day. And that's why when Pilate held up the sign and said, this is what's going to be put over his cross, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. That statement that he would be King of the Jews pictured his unique sacrificial type of kingship. That's why the robes that this king wore were scarlet, stuck to the blood that matched the robe, the blood that was drenching his skin, the blood that he was going to pour out on Calvary, the blood that would pay for our sins in full. And what crown did he wear? Well, he didn't wear the crown of a typical king, as we might think, but he wore a humble crown, a crown of thorns. Now, why thorns? Because in Genesis chapter 3, what was the result of the fall of mankind into sin? Remember, God said that because you have sinned, Adam, cursed is the ground for your sake, for it shall bear thorns and thistles. And so... In a very significant picture, it's as though God takes the curse that mankind deserves due to sin and he places it as a crown upon our Savior's head. Interesting. And you know, all, crown, uh, all kings not only need crowns and robes, but they need thrones. What was the throne of our Savior upon which he was lifted up? It was no gold velvet-covered, soft-padded, comfortable chair, elevated so all could acknowledge him, bow down to his great authority. No, it was a cross of shame. That was his throne. Yes, he was lifted up. John's Gospel emphasizes that. Jesus says that in John 12, verse 32. And if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And it's as though God is holding forth the cross the world today that Christ was lifted up on, that the world would be drawn to him so that they might trust in him for salvation. What did the inscription above the cross say, above his throne? It accurately read, this is the king of the Jews, the king of Israel. You see, Christ had a unique kingship, one in which he was humble. He was born under humble circumstances, he lived his life under humble circumstances, and he died the most humble of all deaths. That's why Philippians 2, 7 through 9 says that he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, 
He truly was a man, though he was fully God. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has also highly exalted him and given him the name, which is above every name. You see, without humility, expressed through the Savior riding a donkey into Jerusalem as king, Christ never would have gone to the cross. He never would have come to earth to become a man, to be our Savior. How very opposite from the idea of kingship that our world exalts and that we know. A humble king. Now isn't this a king who you would want to believe in? A humble king? Isn't this, if you're saved here today, the type of king that you would want to serve? One who would first come not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for all and for you and me. So Christ's kingship in John is a unique, sacrificial kind of kingship. Let's go back to chapter 19 and look at some further details here to understand what is truly transpiring. John 19, and we'll pick it up in verse 23. It says, Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to each one, each soldier a part, and also the tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one piece, so they couldn't cut it up and divide it among the four of them, it would be ruined. So they cast lots, verse 24. They said therefore among themselves, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, by the way, who was the disciple whom he loved? John. If I could just interject here for a moment. Did John write this? describing himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved because, you know, he thought in his mind, well, I'm special among the twelve. But I'm going to describe myself not as John, writing in the third person. No, I think it's an expression of the grasp that John had of the love of Jesus Christ for him. I think John was so amazed. In fact, several times throughout John's gospel, he keeps referring to him. He'll, he'll name the other disciples, Peter and the others. But when he refers to himself, he always says, the disciple whom Jesus loved. I think he was so amazed at the fact that you love me. That's how he described himself. The disciple whom Jesus loved, he was standing by at the cross as well. And Jesus said to his mother, that would be Mary, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple, that disciple took her to his own home. So who is standing by at the cross? We have many witnesses to the events going on there. The people present at the crucifixion included two thieves, one on each side. John has described that in verse 18. The chief priests were there, the scribes and the elders, we know from Matthew's Gospel. There were four Roman soldiers there, according to John 19. The Apostle John was there. Jesus' mother Mary was there. And many other women were there, according to Mark 15. And all that tells us that there were many witnesses to the events of Christ's crucifixion. And some perceived spiritually what was going on. Others didn't. Some, even like the Roman centurion standing by, when Christ had died on the cross, he said, truly, this was the Son of God. He had spiritual apprehension. Do you? But Jesus Christ is there, dying on the cross, and he says, pointing to uh, his mother, he doesn't point, obviously, but he's referencing his mother. In verse 26, he says, woman, behold your son. Now, I was taught as a Roman Catholic that when Jesus Christ said that, woman, behold your son, he was referring to John, the apostle. 
Behold your son. You are now to take him in as your son. And then I was taught, verse 27 means, that when Jesus said to John, the disciple, Behold your mother, that what that speaks of is every Christian has now come under the motherhood of Mary. She is the universal mother of the church. And this was the verse that was used to prove that. But what was Christ saying here? He was simply saying, look, your brothers aren't believers. They have rejected me. We know that from John chapter 7. We know that they don't become believers yet till Acts chapter 1. So the Lord Jesus, in his love for his own mother and care for her, thinking of her while he's dying on the cross, he says, John, I want you to take her in and take care of her. Woman, behold your son. Who's the son? Jesus Christ, dying on the cross. But John here was to take in Mary. Now I say all that because religion, again, obscures these facts and pours in their meaning uh, that's not there inherently in the passage. Growing up Roman Catholic, I was taught that Mary was the mediator, co-mediator with Jesus Christ between me and God. She was the co-mediator of all graces that flowed from God to mankind, so that you had to come to God through Mary. I prayed the rosary regularly, you know, all the Hail Marys, Hail Mary full of grace, etc., over and over and over again. And people in Catholicism practically treat her like a fourth member of the Trinity. And that's very unfortunate, because that is not what this passage is teaching at all. Going on in this passage, we read in verse 28, again, of scriptural fulfillment. Christ's crucifixion involved, over and over again, the fulfillment of scripture. Let's read on from verse 28 through verse 37. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And we'll come back to that crucial phrase in a moment. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. He died. His spirit was separated from his physical body. Therefore, verse 31, because it was the preparation day that the bodies should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs, of those three who were being crucified there, that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was, with, who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Coincidence? I don't think so. Verse 34. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out, proving that he was literally dead. By the way, also proving that he was fully human. This was no phantom or apparition who died on that cross. This was the word of God incarnate, as the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and he died for us as our substitute, as a man. Verse 35, and he who has seen has testified, that is John. John says, I was there at the cross. I saw when he actually died. And I heard what he actually said right before he gave up his spirit. He who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, so that you may believe. For these things were done, that the scripture might be fulfilled, not one of his bones shall be broken. And again, verse 37, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they have pierced. Quoting again, from the Old Testament book of Zechariah. So clearly, Jesus Christ's crucifixion here fulfilled scripture. And in chapter 20, in verse 9, you don't have to read that, but just note this. When Christ has risen from the dead, John notes as well that scripture was fulfilled with Christ's resurrection. Very interesting. Yet, 
If you were to look at John 19, verses 38 through 42, where it speaks of Christ's burial, you will never see that his burial fulfilled scripture. John never mentions that. And I think there's a pattern here we need to observe when it comes to the gospel. We know from 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4, that the gospel is that Christ died for our sins, as our substitute, for our sins. And he rose again the third day. But in that passage, under both of those key accomplishments of Jesus Christ, it says that this was according to the scriptures. And he was buried, and he rose again according to the scriptures, and he was seen. What is the proof that Jesus Christ's death and resurrection is part of the gospel? It fulfilled the scriptures. The proof that he really died was that he was buried. You don't bury living people. The proof that he really rose from the dead was that he was seen. But is the gospel message that saves mankind that Jesus Christ was buried? Stop and think about that. The gospel means good news. Is it good news that a man was buried? Men are buried every day. The good news is in what Christ accomplished by dying for our sins and rising from the dead. And the scriptures back that up as proof. And those who observed he was buried and saw that he rose again, that backed up those key points as proof. And I say that because in John's gospel, it's interesting to note that John only speaks of the scriptural fulfillment of two key events, his death and his resurrection. He never mentions scripture being fulfilled with his burial and his being seen. Because there are a few people in our day who say, well, you know, it's not enough to believe Christ died for your sins and rose again. You also have to believe he was buried or else you can't be saved. And that is patently absurd. His death paid for our sin, his resurrection showed that Jesus Christ had conquered the wages of sin and God the Father accepted the work of his Son, those two great acts provide the grounds of mankind's salvation, not the fact that he was buried, though that is the proof that he really died. But you see the point. Christ's death fulfilled Scripture. That is good news to mankind. Now going on, we also note from this passage in John 19 and elsewhere in the Gospels that the timing of Christ's crucifixion was just before the Sabbath, verse 31 tells us, between the hours of 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. with darkness covering the earth from noon till 3, the last three hours. That's what the other Gospels tell us. In fact, we're told in Matthew 27, verse 52, that there was an earthquake when Jesus Christ died at that moment. We're also told that darkness covered the earth. There was an eclipse like we're going to have later this month. Don't read too much into that one, though. <laughs> and then, of course, Matthew 27, verse 51 tells us that the temple veil was ripped from top to bottom at the moment Jesus Christ gave up his spirit and died. All coincidence? Strange things happening in conjunction with Jesus Christ's death, don't you think? But not coincidence. God was trying to tell the world something by these events. Trying to tell the world, especially with the veil being ripped from top to bottom, that the price for sin has been paid. That sacrificial system where animals were sacrificed for hundreds and hundreds of years leading up to the cross, that picture's been fulfilled, and now that whole system is canned. Christ is the last sacrifice. And because his work is finished, we don't need the picture anymore. It's like when Jesus Christ comes back to earth at his second coming, and we see the real person of Jesus Christ. You know what, as believers, we're not going to be having communion. Saying, well, this... The bread pictures the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. This blood pictures this. Because the real person will be there. You know what religion does? They go back to a system of works. And we're told that the Jews sewed up this curtain 
that had been ripped from top to bottom. By the way, which direction would man rip a curtain if man was behind this event? From bottom to top. But it was ripped from top to bottom, Scripture says, to show that God was the one doing it. But the Jews sewed up that curtain and they went right back to their sacrificial system because they sought to be justified by their works rather than the work of Jesus Christ. Now another fact that we need to understand from John 19 is that Christ's crucifixion involved his actual death. His actual death. Verses 31 through 34 make it very clear that he really did die. Do you know that if you were to read the Quran, the holy book so-called of Islam, it would say that Jesus Christ didn't really die. They just, they, those Christians just say he died. He didn't really die. There was also a form of false teaching that was satanically inspired in the first few centuries of church history called Gnosticism. And Gnosticism taught that material things are evil, but that which is invisible and spiritual, well, that's the good part. So if your body is material and physical, well, that's a bad thing. So Jesus couldn't have had a body. He had to have been just spirit. And so in many Gnostic writings, you will read that the Christ descended upon someone named Jesus, and though Jesus died physically on a cross, the Christ spirit didn't and the Christ never rose from the dead. That is utterly satanic. The Gospel of John teaches that Jesus is the Christ, and the Christ died for our sins. He was fully human, and he rose from the grave. And because he was fully human, he could be our perfect substitute and mediator between us and a holy God. So that's one imbalance, to see the physical or to see the spiritual and not the physical. But then there's the other imbalance of many in religion today who see only the physical and not the spiritual. It amazes me, every Easter time, you hear stories of people in the Philippines, largely Roman Catholics, of course, who want to imitate the Lord Jesus Christ in his sufferings, and so they allow themselves to be crucified, and they reenact the crucifixion scene. And it's not just for show. Do you know why they're doing this? Because they actually think that their physical suffering mixed with Jesus Christ's suffering will make atonement for sin. And they miss the point of Calvary. They miss the spiritual aspect. For you see, when Jesus Christ was hanging on that cross, he uttered seven statements from the cross. We've read some of them towards the end of this list here. I thirst and it is finished. But right before he said, I thirst, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now that's not recorded in John's gospel. John records the it is finished statement in contrast to the other gospels. But both my God, my God, why have you forsaken me and it is finished fit together like hand in glove. For do you know why Jesus Christ cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's because he was dying for us spiritually on that cross. You see, going back to Genesis 2, verse uh, 16 and 17, the Lord had told Adam that in the day you eat thereof, from that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. Did Adam eat? He did. Did he die that day? Was God's word true? Yes, he did die. But the scriptures tell us he didn't drop over physically dead or hundreds of years later. But he did die spiritually that day. For death in the Bible is always defined as separation from God, not non-existence. From the moment Adam sinned, he was separated spiritually from God and needed reconciliation. That's why I like what Charles Ryrie said in regards to the nature of Christ's spiritual death and this expression, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Ryrie says, the first three sayings from the cross were probably all spoken before noon. This one, which is in every way central, was uttered about 3 p.m. after three hours of darkness and silence during which the Son of God bore the sin of the world. 
In that work, he had to be forsaken by God, i.e. God the Father. And yet at the same time, there was no splitting up of the Trinity. All, this, all that is involved is inscrutable, but he gave himself, he was made sin, he bore our sins, and his soul was made an offering for sin. And by the way, Ryrie's quoting Isaiah 53 there. His work was to bear sin. That's what he accomplished. You see, in John chapter 18, verse 11, when Peter seeks to rescue the Lord Jesus, as if he needs it, from the hands of the temple priests who came to arrest Jesus, Jesus says, Peter, put your sword back in its scabbard. I don't need your help. But he says to him in John 18, 11, the cup which the Father has given to me, shall I not drink it? What cup was that? The other Gospels tell us that this was a cup of suffering, a cup of wrath. The wrath of a holy God upon sinful mankind that we deserved. A cup that had been filling up for centuries. A cup filled to the last drop with the first human sin of Adam and Eve all the way to the last man. And God the Father handed it to his son and said, drink it. Pay for the sin of mankind. And the Lord Jesus Christ willingly took the wrath of Almighty God and was separated spiritually from that, his Holy Father upon that cross. And that's why he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because this separation was due to a judgment that was occurring upon the cross. A judgment that we deserved. That's why when God gave the Ten Commandments to mankind and said, thou shalt, thou shalt, thou shalt, and we've broken one, two, three, right down the list. The Ten Commandments were not given as a means by which we could measure our righteousness to measure up enough to be saved, but in fact to show that we can't measure up and Christ had to die for our sin. You see, the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23, and those wages were placed upon God's Son, our substitute, the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah 53, verses 5 and 6 say, But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. When Christ cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Our iniquity is being placed upon God's Son. And all this speaks of God's undeserved favor and kindness towards those who deserve the very opposite, namely his judgment. That is grace. And that's why in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, it says, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. You see, if Christ's work paid for all sin, what sins are left to pay for by our good works? None. That's why, though it cost God everything, it can be free to us. Do you see the difference? Are you trusting in his grace and the finished work of Christ or in your good works? If you are trusting in your works, then you are rejecting the work that God has provided through his son. Now let's go back to John 19 and examine more carefully these key statements that underscore everything I've just said to this point. In John 19, it says... Verse 30, so when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. This word, finished, plays a key role in John's gospel in emphasizing the finished work of Jesus Christ. Oftentimes we speak uh, doctrinally about the person and work or finished work of Jesus Christ. But does that expression, finished work, have a biblical basis? It certainly does. Right here in John 19, Christ says, it is finished. But I don't see the word work attached to this. Well, go with me back to chapter 17. In chapter 17, on the night before Christ was crucified, he's in the upper room with his disciples. And in chapter 17, we have his prayer to God the Father. Notice what he says in verse 4. 
He tells the Father, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. Now that's what's called a proleptic statement. It was so certain he would die the next day and finish the work, he could speak of it as having already been complete. But notice, finished and work are tied together here in verse 4. Go with me next to uh, chapter 5. And look at verse 36. Christ says here, but I have a greater witness than John's, that is John the Baptist, for the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do, they bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. Look at chapter 4 and look at verse 34. Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Clearly, Christ's work was complete upon the cross. He had paid for our sin in full, and thus there was nothing left to pay. That statement, to Telestai, says it all, that Christ's work was a work of redemption. He had paid for it all. So the word finished, to Telestai, it's one word in Greek, is used earlier in John's Gospel, coupled with the word work. We cannot miss that point. It's very, very important. But here's another point that we need to see in John's Gospel. That the Lord's identification as the Lamb of God shows that his purpose in coming to earth was to be a sacrifice for the sin of the world. All the way back in John chapter 1, verse 29, John the Baptist pointed to Jesus Christ the very first time he saw Jesus coming, and he said, Behold! the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The very first thing he says about the Lord Jesus, that was the thing that was most significant to John. He was identified right off the bat as the one who fulfilled centuries of typology of all those animal sacrifices. Jesus Christ was the one who finally came and paid the debt in full. And it's as though... John the writer, again, is handing a set of rose-colored glasses to the reader, saying, put these on, and now read the rest of the story. And you're going to see a crimson thread that runs all the way through this book leading up to Calvary. The Lamb of God, who would die for the sins of the world. What else do we see in John's Gospel? Well, we see that Jesus Christ's life is set within a Passover theme. Throughout John's Gospel, the Passover is mentioned uh, many times. I think it's like ten, 10 times or so. The word feast in reference to the Passover is used at least another 10 times or so. You could say maybe 20 times the Passover is referred to. Not just as a marker chronologically so we could know that Christ's earthly ministry lasted about three years, but I think the Lord was trying to tell us something by this Passover reference. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 12 in your Old Testaments to see this. This becomes quite fascinating. Does John intend to portray the Lord Jesus Christ's crucifixion as a fulfillment of the Passover sacrifice? Absolutely, without question. What we see in John's Gospel <clears throat> is that there are several themes. There's a glory theme in which his, his glory is a unique glory pointing to the cross. There's a Passover theme. We've already seen the kingship theme. There's also a theme called the hour theme. All the way back in John 2, Jesus told his mother, my hour has not yet come. But his hour finally does arrive at the cross. Well, there we have our little thing again. But you can see all of John's gospel is pointing to the cross and to the resurrection. There's a consummate perspective of Jesus as the Christ in this book. Now in Exodus chapter 12, look with me at verse 3. It says, here's the instruction for the Passover. 
Verse 3, speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying on the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And what we see is that the Lord Jesus entered Jerusalem again on the very day that the Passover lamb was selected to die on behalf of the nation of Israel. Exodus 12, verse 3, takes place several days before uh, the actual sacrifice of that Passover lamb. So the lamb was to be selected. In Christ's case, it was Monday of Passover week. And the lambs were to be slaughtered on a Friday, what we would call Good Friday, on which, the day on which Christ would die. Going on, we read in verses 4 through 6, And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons, according to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year, you may take it from the sheep or the goats. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. What we see was not only was Christ selected to be the Passover lamb on the 10th of the month of what we would call April, but four days after that, he was to be slaughtered as this sacrificial lamb. Christ was crucified on the very day and at the very time that the Passover lambs were being killed in Jerusalem. Remember, he hung on the cross from 9 a.m. till 3. At 3 o'clock is when those Passover lambs were being slaughtered for the Passover according to the Gospel of John. Very, very interesting. Now, another fact that we see here in, in Exodus, look in chapter 12 at verse 22, is it says, And you shall take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood, that is the Passover lamb's blood, that is in the basin, and strike the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin, and none of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning. There was also hyssop and a basin present at the cross, according to John 19, just like the Passover describes. It was like a brush, this hyssop, and they were to dab this blood over the doorpost to their house, showing that a house was to be marked, that each house was to appropriate that sacrificial Passover lamb's blood, and that each family was to take refuge within that house under the shelter of that blood. Can I ask you here today, have you personally appropriated the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ for you and for your sins? Not with a sponge or a hyssop. There's no bucket to dip it in. But to appropriate it by faith. Believing that you need to take refuge under the shelter of Christ's work on the cross. Now, while we're in Exodus 12, look at verse 13. It says in verse 13, Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, the Lord says, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. The blood of the sacrifice was seen by those who were present. And no doubt it was seen by God the Father as well, just like the Passover. This was to be marked on each house. You see, when God sees the blood of Jesus Christ, that, that pouring out of his life as a sacrifice for our sin because the wages of sin is death, he is satisfied with that work. And only if God sees us through the work of Jesus Christ can we be accepted by him. What does God see when he looks at you? Have you taken your good works and put them between you and God and said, here, God, accept me on this basis? I tell you, you will, be, you will eternally perish if that is true of you, just like the Egyptians perished in the plague that night if they didn't have the blood. 
Now going on, in John chapter 19, we see another significant fact. It says in verse 36 that not a bone of him was broken. And that's because it says in Exodus 12 verse 46 that the Passover lamb was not to have his bones or its bones broken. Very interesting. Christ could have had his bones broken, but the soldier put a spear in his side and said, oh, he's already dead. No need to break his legs and crush his bones. Now, I think it's significant because as far as biblical typology goes, this picture God is painting for us, there's no significance in broken bones, but there is significance in the pouring out of blood, right? Because the life is in the blood. Life had to be given as a payment for our sin. We come to a final very, very significant point in John 19, and that is that Christ's cry, it is finished, tetelestai, one word in the Greek, is used elsewhere in the New Testament as well as in Greek culture of that day to speak of the payment of a debt. The payment of a debt. One writer, Bob Wilkin, who holds to a crossless gospel, says, the popular notion that tetelestai here also means it, namely redemption, has been paid in full, is not supported by the lexical evidence. While it is true that Christ's death paid for the sins of all people, John 1, that is not what verse 30 means, he says. But that's not the precise meaning here. Well, it is true that this word teleo, speaks of something that is complete or accomplished. It can also mean paid. Uh, we know from one lexicon that receipts are often introduced in the ancient world by the phrase tetelestai. And there were two men, British explorers, or papyrologists actually, who found about 100 years ago, buried in the sands of Egypt, hundreds of documents of commerce from that day. And what they discovered was that several of these documents when there was a paid receipt, they have marked on them the word tetelestai, 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 tetelestai. Paid in full, paid in full, paid in full, paid in full. What is the statement that Christ utters from the cross? Tetelestai, paid in full. The word is used this way in its root word, teleo, in Matthew 17, verse 24, for the paying of tax. It's used that way as well in Romans 13, verse 6. So there is biblical and lexical support for this. But don't miss the spiritual significance to all this, dear believer here today or unbeliever. When Christ cried out, it is finished, he meant the debt for sin had been paid in full. And the proof of that was that he rose from the grave, that God the Father accepted the work of his Son. And what that means to you here today is that eternal life is a free gift, not a reward for the good that you may do. It's God's gift. But religion obscures this, doesn't it? Here is a church in New York called, ironically, the Church of St. John the Divine. Started in 1892, it has been in a continual rebuilding and remodeling process. Interrupted by two world wars, its doors were shut for several years, but the work goes on. What a picture of religion. Always working, always trying to be accepted by God, by our works, which can never be enough because religion rejects the fact that the work is finished. There are basically two approaches to e getting eternal life from God, the work approach or Christ's work approach. There's try and then there's trust in what Christ has done. There's do on man's part or done as far as Christ's work is concerned. Which are you trusting in? But you know, according to religion, they say, well, in order to get your sins to outweigh, you know, you've got to get your good works to outweigh your sin, and God will accept you on that basis. I tell you, you will never adequately outweigh your sin because the only thing that took care of sin was the work of Christ. In the religion I grew up in, there was always one more mass that needed to be said, more prayers that needed to be done, more giving, more sacrificing. And even in evangelical religion today, there's always one more altar call, one more dedication or rededication of your life. None of those things make us acceptable before God. 
Again, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says that eternal life, salvation, is God's gift to mankind on the basis of God's grace. And it's received through simple faith. What does this provide for you, this gift of eternal life, to you as a believer? If you do believe here today, it provides you with absolute assurance. You can know on the authority of Christ's statement on the cross, on the authority of God's word, that the debt has been paid in full. Will you accept that? Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's an invitation to come to God the Father through Christ. It is finished. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you again for the work of your Son. We can rest upon a work knowing that you are satisfied, knowing that it's complete, and only that gives absolute assurance. I pray if there be anyone here today, Father, who doesn't know this for certain, that today would be the day of salvation for them. For us who have been saved by your grace, I pray we would just rejoice in this. Thank you for the clear and amazing testimony of the Gospel of John to this end. And we pray now and give thanks for your Son, and we pray in his name.